Hello, my name is Garish Mishra from Wake Forest University. As you know, patients with chronic pain, and specifically chronic pancreatitis, as well as pancreatic cancer, suffer from tremendous amounts of pain. Endoscopic ultrasound-guided celiac plexus block uh, provides us a unique opportunity to provide a fairly um, quick uh, and accurate way of injecting uh, medications into the celiac ganglia. This case that you're going to see highlights the use of the Wilson Cook celiac plexus needle. Uh, it's a wonderful needle in that there's more diffusion capacity uh, for the uh, um, injectate, whether it be bipivacaine, kenalog, or alcohol. Um, how the technique that you'll see me using uses this needle, um, and the celiac ganglia uh, undergoes this uh, block with the diffusion approach. However, as we've learned recently by, uh, from papers by Dr. Levy as well as Dr. Gerke, one now can actually visualize the celiac ganglia. In the video that you'll, be, you'll just see uh, momentarily, uh, I say that we're unable to visualize the ganglia directly. However, we now know within the past several months that this is not true. Um, the techniques would be very similar, and I think this video will be very instructional for you uh, but please do know that there are several new exciting approaches uh, that directly visualize the ganglia. We're uh, getting ready to do a celiac plexus block on um, a gentleman here who uh, has a, uh, a fairly significant prior history of uh, alcohol use and uh, has uh, chronic calcific pancreatitis for which he underwent a, a pusteau procedure done by one of our surgeons. Uh, in a pusteau procedure, basically, uh, it's not a Whipple, so they're not removing the pancreatic head, but it's done uh, to relieve ductal obstruction in the pancreatic duct, uh, basically creating a conduit between the intestine and the main pancreatic duct, so there's drainage. Unfortunately, he didn't get much relief from his pusteau procedure, uh, and he underwent a, uh, uh, an attempt at celiac block, uh, he's had one prior, actually two prior attempts. The first attempt, or the first procedure, gave him uh, nearly six months pain relief, which was quite significant. And the other thing that was very significant in our gentleman's case is that um, he was able to eat again. And so for six months, he said he had a voracious appetite, ate pretty much whatever he wanted to. However, his symptoms of abdominal pain uh, diarrhea return and then we attempted another celiac plexus block uh, and that did not give him as much or the longevity of relief that he had with the first one so uh, he's um, uh, we've been asked again by our surgical colleague here uh, and the patient to uh, try uh, and attempt another block I think today will be the first using the new needle uh, in hopes that perhaps there's greater diffusion of the agent that we're going to use. The first thing uh, before we do anything is getting the informed consent and the procedure itself uh, is very similar to that of a standard endoscopy. However, we inform the patients that uh, they might have some hypotension uh, related to the procedure. So we tend to uh, infuse them with saline pretty well uh, before the procedure and, and afterwards as well in case they do have hypotension. The other thing that I uh, get consent or discuss with them is the chance of um, uh, diarrhea that may occur transiently after the procedure or for several days. Uh, and then finally the, the risk of paraplegia is so remote with an anterior approach which we are um, going to perform versus a posterior approach that is often done by uh, anesthesia and, and in that case uh, the spinal artery can be uh, inadvertently nicked leading to transient or complete paraplegia so hopefully we avoid all those but I do discuss all those uh, with the patient. The celiac plexus block in the entire procedure uh, there are several ways to approach it there are many folks at uh, centers that when this is done in the setting of pancreatic cancer uh, will often get a tissue diagnosis and consent for a block. However, we know this patient quite well. He does not have pancreatic cancer. He has chronic pancreatitis, 
So therefore, I don't spend significant time um, looking at the pancreas and we go uh, to uh, exactly what we need to do. But just by uh, showing you this case so that you can appreciate the extent of calcification, this, um, I'll, I'll use a pointer here, this gentleman right here uh, has severe chronic calcific pancreatitis and uh, where the pointer is going to all these represent calcifications. So I think unequiv unequivocally or undeniably anybody who comes in into the room and, and looks at this EUS image will be very impressed with the fact that he's got severe chronic calcific pancreatitis. There is no denying this. There's nothing subtle about this case at all in terms of what his disease process is. So then um, if, you, if you've established the fact uh, the first thing we do is we actually locate the aorta as it enters the uh, abdomen and the first takeoff from the aorta is represents the celiac artery. The second uh, takeoff uh, immediately distal to that is the superior mesenteric artery and it's rare that we see it in the same plane but I believe the reason we're able to do this uh, or see it in such fashion on this gentleman is because he's very thin and he's also had a, a surgical procedure done so that uh, the pancreas is in fact very uh, nicely tucked in behind the stomach. Um, so here's our celiac takeoff right here. This represents the celiac artery and this next takeoff represents the superior mesenteric artery. But we extrapolate and surmise that the celiac ganglia is in very close proximity to the celiac artery and in fact that's well known by anatomy and our anatomical lessons that that is indeed the case. So once we've identified the celiac artery right here, the takeoff, we will then um, hone in and we can Doppler this area just for, uh, for confirmation and I think everyone can appreciate that's the aorta and right just anterior there you see two huge uh, flows representing the celiac trunks or celiac artery and the superior mesenteric artery. We can also we also have the ability of Dopplering to show that it is arterial, and that's definitely an arterial flow with uh, the uh, uh, systole and diastole. The other thing that's rather important is prior to celiac block. Uh, unlike when we perform fine needle aspiration where we may not seek Doppler confirmation, I think it is imperative that you Doppler the potential space of where the needle will go. And so the space of the needle or the track of the needle will basically take off from here all the way down to this anterior space where the celiac trunk is. So if we're, if we're to do that, I, I do think it's important that we Doppler. And in this particular patient, I think we're free here. For a while there I thought he does have a takeoff whether it's a left gastric branch off the main aorta but there is some blood flow right above the um, celiac artery so we will hope to avoid that area and we'll uh, proceed to perform the procedure in this uh, plane. There's several approaches uh, to this. Um, some folks actually inject uh, saline um, into the syringe and will push saline into the potential space and then aspirate back for blood. That, that, that's a very well-known approach. Uh, we have not been doing that and we actually go directly into the space, aspirate back for any potential blood. Uh, and the space that I'm referring to again, we see the celiac takeoff and folks uh, will often inject just anterior to this or the alternate approach is to inject in both the anterior and posterior uh, uh, areas away from the celiac artery uh, and uh, the way I decide whether I should do that, it really depends on the anatomy of the patient. If I get uh, great anatomical landmarks and locations, often I'll do an anterior and posterior. Right now this will be an anterior approach and before we inject uh, any agents uh, we will uh, make sure that there's no blood flow. 
So I'm pushing the needle out and in fact it is fairly echogenic um, and we're getting a good view. The only potential downside uh, to the CPN needle is that perhaps it's more blunt and not as sharp uh, and therefore the stylet uh, remains in the, uh, in the sheath here. The uh, vessel is overlying the uh, artery right there. So the needle is in a good position. See the crease of the diaphragm and then the takeoff, and there's not much space between the celiac artery takeoff and uh, my puncture site. So. Uh, I just have to be careful I don't go into the celiac artery and he's got a arterial takeoff uh, off the main aorta in that vicinity so it makes it a little bit challenging. I don't have a whole lot of room. Okay, I feel like I've, okay, yeah, go ahead. So you can see the needle. I've just rotated a little bit away from the Break back. Okay, so go ahead. We've aspirated for blood and we don't see any. And you can see on the EUS image there's a fairly significant blush uh, or hypervascular or hyperechoic blush. Uh, and uh, what is quite unique with the current needle design is that there's minimal resistance um, in the old format. It was the, we look for the resistance to know that we're in the space, but because of the uh, three or four holes, okay, that's good, you can undo that. So we've just injected approximately how many cc's? 11. 11 oh. cc's total, uh, and that went in very smoothly uh, without a significant resistance, which I can tell you with the prior needles, um, it took, uh, people like myself sitting on the needle to push that through, it was so hard. Um, and that is clearly not the case, so. I will take one look to see if there's another plane that I might be able to inject. And then we'll be done. The, the key difference between a celiac plexus block and a celiac plexus neurolysis, so CP, CPB versus CPN, Really, the technique is exactly identical. Uh, it's bupivacaine and Kenalog for CPB, or celiac plexus block, whereas CPN, or celiac plexus neurolysis, it's bupivacaine followed by alcohol injection. The reason, um, we, we reserve alcohol injection for pancreatic cancer patients where the effect is more long-lasting. Uh, however, with alcohol injection, you do increase the risk that if um, an artery or uh, p potential paraplegia with alcohol because you're ablating that area. And therefore, uh, we, we typically don't use alcohol for chronic pancreatitis patients such as this gentleman, uh, although some people have done it and, and have done it quite safely. So if he uh, were to have a pancreatic cancer uh, that's metastatic or unresectable, then pain control um, is, is a real issue and then we would use uh, to, um, alcohol uh, in that scenario. Some of the thing, subtle nuances that I don't know yet because I haven't been using the needle long enough, it hasn't been available to us until recently, is how critical is this stylet before we puncture. Uh, the needle tip is blunter so that went in fairly easily. The entire procedure um, shouldn't take but five to ten minutes uh, once proper landmarks are located. And here I'm going to maintain visualization of the artery. It's a very small space uh, of several millimeters uh, between the, so I'll try but I may not succeed in this particular case unless it's Okay, so I just, yeah, I 
I felt a, a, a pop and I'm in that space and we will check for blood return. Uh huh. Okay, go ahead and inject. And you can see this blush. I've just withdrawn my needle just a little bit. And I'm looking uh, at the EUS screen while Mary, uh, our nurse, EUS nurse, who uh, is very comfortable with the anatomy. It's, it's critical because it's a team effort and I can't focus or I can't see what she's doing because I'm, and, okay, go ahead, yeah. So that went in pretty nicely and we're gonna pull back and we're basically done. But uh, the key is identifying the landmarks and, um, and maintaining visualization at all times. Um, and we're, we're done on this patient. So uh, from start to finish, it can be a little bit quicker, uh, perhaps 10 minutes, but uh, this didn't take us too long. And uh, it's quite variable in terms of how much relief the patients uh, receive. Uh, and this can be repeated every several weeks uh, if need be uh, and uh, in these patients where they're on such narcotics such uh, severe medications or quantity uh, even giving them six weeks of pain relief um, with decreased narcotic usage and the ability to eat what they enjoy uh, I think really does impact quality of life and uh, the major studies done with celiac plexus blocks have been done by uh, Dr. Frank Gress uh, at Duke, Dr. Moritz Viersum and his uh, colleagues, Dr. Naresh uh, Gunaratnam, uh, um, Dr. Viersum is at Indiana and Fort Wayne, and, and uh, Dr. Gunaratnam is at St. Joseph's in Ann Arbor. And, and they've all shown that this works and the patients do have uh, significant uh, control of their pain uh, with markedly decreased um, narcotic usage uh, using a visual analog scale.